personal style should be dictated by lifestyle. So let's say I love to wear t-shirts or I love to wear casual shirts. If I work in a law firm, I kind of have to conform to the law firm because, you know, that's your way of life. That's how you make a living. And Mm -hmm. you don't want to walk walk in that law firm and be underdressed because if someone has an important case, if they're suing someone for a medical malpractice and you show up in a t-shirt and jeans, unfortunately, as human beings, we have um, a tendency to basically pass judgment on people just by the way that they appear or show up. So you can you can see how that could quickly be uh, a poor choice of attire. So first, I would say, think about who your audience is. What is your lifestyle? What are you doing for work? Are you in a professional environment? And start there. When you figure who your audience is, how are you going to be showing up every day? Where are you going to be showing up every day? Now you can start to think about what are your personal preferences? You're listening to the Black to Business Podcast, an educational podcast providing Black entrepreneurs with the tools and resources to start and grow their businesses. We chat with vetted Black entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and business owners as they provide tips and resources to help take your business to the next level. I'm your host, Monique T. Marshall. Welcome back to the Black to Business Podcast. I'm your host, Monique T. Marshall, and I am so happy that you have joined us today. This month is truly special because for the entire month of June, we are celebrating Black men leading in the community and in business. It's something that we do every year because we believe in recognizing the incredible contributions of Black men. And to honor that, we have some exciting things planned. So each week on the podcast, we will be highlighting Black men who are making a difference. But that's not all. We've partnered with the Spot NYC to bring back our highly anticipated Black Men Who Lead panel, which is happening on June 17th at 6.30 p.m. at City Point in downtown Brooklyn. So you definitely don't want to miss this because we have an incredible lineup of speakers and thought-provoking discussions. And guess what? We're hosting this event in Washington, D.C. as well on September 21st. So stay tuned for more details on D.C. But in the meantime, visit our brand new website that just launched today to get your tickets and see the entire list of Black men at BlackMenWhoLead.com. Now, for today, we have a very special guest with us who is going to share some invaluable insights on a topic that is crucial for entrepreneurs, especially Black men who aspire to lead in business. We are thrilled to have Fola Lawson, the creative director and co-founder of Southern Gents, joining us today. Fola is an expert in elevating personal image and brand presence, and he's going to dive deep into this topic with us. On today's episode, we will explore the importance of understanding personal style, mastering the art of dressing, where the curated and simple is your wardrobe, and the impact of personal image on business leaders. Fola will also share his expertise on attire, grooming, and modern approach to men's dressing. But here's what makes this episode even more special. We will specifically focus on how these topics relate to Black men and Black men in business. Fola will address the unique challenges and opportunities that Black men face when it comes to personal image and brand presence. It's a conversation that not only is inspiring, but also empowering for our aspiring and new Black entrepreneurs. So without further ado, let's dive into the conversation. Fola, welcome to the Black to Business podcast. Such a treat to have you here. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yes. So before we dive into today's topic, I always like to get my audience familiar with who I'm speaking with. So if you could just share a little bit about your story, how did you get where you are today and what is it that you do in your business? Awesome. So I'll start with what I do in my business. I am the co-founder and creative director of Southern Gents. Um, I do a little bit of everything, uh, but my focus is designing and putting together Uh, wonderful products that our customers will absolutely love and cherish for a lifetime. And that also transcends into other things like styling, photography, videography, overall branding. Um, And then as far as my background is concerned, uh, I have a career in finance and accounting. I was a CPA and practice accounting for uh, almost or just about 10 years, uh, started off my career in public accounting, bounced around in a couple of different industries from engineering to hospitality to 
healthcare. So I I have had the opportunity to have a well-rounded professional background. I've seen a lot in throughout my professional experience in the, in the workforce, and I've tried over my years to apply that to our brand over the course of our journey. Southern Gen started just uh, from a desire to just be the best ve- ver- possible version of myself, if I would say. Uh, I had graduated college, and I was basically looking for things to do in my spare time, ways to elevate myself. Uh, I wanted to dress better. I was a young black guy in corporate America, and um, I had always subscribed to GQ, and I started paying more attention now that I had this job and I was making decent money and no longer having to deal with my bank account, always being in overdraft. Right. Uh, so um, I was like, you know, what can I do to continue imp- uh, to improve myself? Because it was tough when I was in college. Um, in most of my classes, if there were five black people, three of them were black women and two of them were black men, if not just only me. So it's kind of like it's been lonely and lonelier as you ascend, you know, through through the ranks of education. And and when you get into the workforce, it becomes really, really prevalent. You get a job. No one looks like you. And you just are trying to uh, blend in and be accepted as much as possible, uh, not be subject to any kind of like stereotypes. So you really basically want to carve a name out for yourself. So I started just researching, looking into men's style. As I looked into men's style, I I started finding that there were not a lot of places to go in Houston that you could really practice that style, whether it's going to happy hour. So long story short, uh, I got a group group of friends and talked them into just curating a networking hour where we would focus on everyone looking stylish, but of course, in after work attire, just come in your work attire from work on a Thursday or Friday. We put one together, one turned into five, five turned into 10. And we had, we started having these events that were just a talk of the town and people would look forward to get to coming to on a monthly basis. Uh, It was amazing. We decided to transform those events into small pop-up shops with an accessory brand and, uh, Ten years later, here we are, Southern Gents as a full-on menswear brand that offers uh, wonderful products direct to consumer to men everywhere in America and across the globe. Mm, such a beautiful story and journey. So thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, I know people can relate also to your personal journey, and I think it's perfect to talk with you about today's topic, which is elevating your personal image and brand presence as you have done. So let's start out by talking about personal style. So Fola, when it comes to personal style, what does that mean to you when you hear that? Uh, Personal style is just the way that you like to appear and present yourself to the world. And it it has something to do more of more with consistency. So Mm -hmm. uh, with style, it's something that you almost shouldn't have to think about. So there's a cartoon that always comes to mind when I think about style. And I don't know if you're familiar with Dexter's Lab. Mm -hmm. cartoon Dexter always had he had he had in his closet like 10 of the same things he had his black trousers his white lab coat his shirt and his tie and that was kind of like his daily uniform right and Mm -hmm. he wouldn't really think much about it he would just throw it on and that can mean a lot of different things in everyday life Um, it depends on your actual lifestyle so I think that personal style is dictated by your lifestyle Uh, when I was in the professional workforce my Personal style had a lot to do with blazers, button down shirts, trousers, loafers, dress shoes. Now it's evolved a little bit more because my day to day is a little bit more dynamic. Some mm-hmm. days I'm in the field, I'm, I'm doing some photography work in the studio. Some days I'm out on the street doing some creative work. So that's a different type of attire. Obviously, I'm not trying to be in the streets trying right. to assist videographers and photographers in a blazer and 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 dress mm-hmm. shoes. So it, it really is determined by what your day-to-day life looks like. And then on the weekend, you could be a little bit more creative, more playful. So it's this blend of what your life looks like. And just, I look at personal style as your battle armor of how to tackle your day. Mm, 
Oh, I like that. Okay. So would you say if there is, would you say there's a difference between the personal style versus like fashion? Oh, most definitely. Mm -hmm. So I look at fashion as fashion is fun. Fashion is a moment in time. Uh, Fashion is uh, something that you get to indulge in. It's like a a good time. You're going to an event or you're going to a show or you're going to a travel destination, whereas style is daily, you know. So Mm -hmm. uh, style is more classic. It's more timeless. I would say that style is an extension of who you are and style is what you do and how you are when no one is looking, or at least you're unaware that people are looking. Got it. Now this is the Black to Business podcast. So of course, we're talking to mostly entrepreneurs or those who are looking to transition into entrepreneurship full time, what have you. Why do you think personal style is important for entrepreneurs? Ah, that's an amazing question. I'll tell you, even before becoming an entrepreneur, Style is important as a person, period. And um, I think it's important, specifically if you're an entrepreneur, because you're seen before you're heard, right? So mm-hmm. if someone sees you before they speak to you, uh, they see what you're wearing. They see how you've presented yourself. And, you know, we sometimes we could get caught on a bad day, bad hair day. You know, we just roll out mm-hmm. of bed running some errands. But there's more often than not, if you're an entrepreneur, you're a mover and shaker. You're networking with people. You're making business deals. You're dealing with vendors or suppliers and or customers. So how people see you is very important because you can basically lay a foundation of how that conversation takes place with just the way that you show up, if if that makes sense. So Mm -hmm. the way that you enter a room speaks volumes about how you conduct your business, um, how detailed you are. And it doesn't necessarily need to be flashy, but, you know, some people have a more vibrant style. Some people have a casual style, but, um, and then some people just show up. And I think we all know when we see highly uh, revered people, they almost never show up uh, accidentally. Right. You can tell that they show up in a specific way. Um, mm-hmm. I, can, I can name a number of celebrities. When we think of most celebrities or entrepreneurship juggernauts, they're always looking positive in some. It, it may be different, but they have a way of presenting themselves to the rest of the world. And that's not something that takes place uh, without any thought or rhyme or reason. Mm hmm. Yeah, certainly. I hate what I'm wearing that um, nobody's going to see me outfit and I run into everybody. I just hate that. Exactly. <laughs> I so I try not to, but it's like, oh, so I do it with less and less. But yeah, you're so right. And that's when you have to kind of have some elevated like basics or now what yes. people refer to as athleisure. So as a woman, it could be yoga pants and some clean sneakers, some vans or just something that doesn't really require much thought. But again, going back to the Dexter's Lab analogy, just mm-hmm. like a set of gear that you can just throw on because you really never know who you meet. And yeah. life has this funny way of introducing people who are really important and we didn't plan to meet at um, random places and unplanned times. So you're not always going to be looking dressed to the nines, but I know how mm-hmm. it feels to like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that this person saw me this way. And it's like you, yeah. you're standing with one hand over your face and <laughs> that kind of deal. So yeah, it's very important to just take your imagery and presentation uh, seriously. Yeah, I certainly had that happen recently. I was in um, Starbucks. I was always in there. And then this one time I see like my old college uh, classmate and then I see somebody in business I know. So after that, I went to like a TJ Maxx and Marshalls and got me some little sweatpants. <laughs> I'm like, Mm-mm, you got to have something. So thank you. you felt like they were, you felt like they were looking at you like, uh-uh, yeah. Monique is struggling out here. <laughs> Girl, is everything OK? Right. It was. Yeah, it was that day. So got it. Yoga pants. I love that. And so for people who are listening who are like, okay, I know I need to do this, but how do I discover what my personal style is? What would you say? Great question. And um, so style is a blend of personal personal Mm -hmm. taste. And it's also the other side of that is presentation. So you have to pay attention to your audience. And so I think that uh, personal style should be dictated by 
lifestyle. So let's say I love to wear t-shirts or I love to wear casual shirts. If I work in a law firm, I kind of have to conform to the law firm because, you know, that's your way of life. That's how you make a living. And mm-hmm. you don't want to walk walk in that law firm and be underdressed because if someone has an important case, if they're suing someone for a medical malpractice and you show up in a t-shirt and jeans, unfortunately, as human beings, we have um, a tendency to basically pass judgment on people just by the way that they appear or show up. So you can you can see how that could quickly be uh, a poor choice of attire. So first, I would say, think about who your audience is. What is your lifestyle? What are you doing for work? Are you in a professional environment? And start there. When you figure who your audience is, how you're going to be showing up every day, where you're going to be showing up every day, now you can start to think about What are your personal preferences? So if you work in this professional environment, like a a law firm, maybe you enjoy looking really clean and a blazer and tie works well for you. Maybe you just don't like the um, the tightness and uncomfortability that a lot of men uh, often complain about with a necktie and a dress shirt. Okay, great. Maybe you can trade in your blazer for a vest and you can wear a clean button down with the sleeves rolled up and your shirt tucked in, or you could even opt for a polo instead of a dress shirt. There's so many options. Um, I think that First, figuring out your audience is definitely the start. And then think about the things that you like. Find some from some guys of inspiration, whether it's a Pinterest page or a content creator influencer who dresses along the lines of your personal uh, style goals. And then there's also tons of books and publications that you can order. A great one is a a, a book called Dress Code by by Esquire. It's called The Esquire Dress Code by Jay Fielden. It's currently on sale on Amazon for $10. That book would spell out what you need to wear in a professional environment, how you need to dress in your 20s, your 30s, what you should be wearing in your 50s, 60s on the weekend. It's a very, very well detailed catalog of how to approach men's style. And it's not a one a one theory fits all. Somewhere in there, you should be able to find little doses of your personal style. Mm. So, Fola, when you were speaking, you are so amazing. I want to tell you that because I'm just like being able to envision all of this. You painted the perfect picture. So I love that. Thank and you then, so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. And you said things that you should wear in your 30s or things like that. So I'm in my 30s. People who are listening are typically in their 30s as well. What are some things that people are still doing that they shouldn't in their 30s? Oh, man, you're going to get me in trouble here. (laughs) Um, So let me start with myself. That way, you know, we're talking about style is so subjective and you can offend people. So in my 20s, I was a huge fan of distressed jeans, ripped jeans, and I would still style them properly and like try to clean them up with maybe like a lace up boot or something. But as I've grown older, now I'm 37. I'm an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. And like you said, sometimes I'm in a Starbucks or I'm running errands in the mall for a photo shoot and I'm picking up some styling pieces. And I'm very, very, I'm more than ever, I'm more conscious about how I present myself to the world. Cause again, just like you said, you never know who you're going to meet. Mm-hmm. Someone could recognize me and say, Oh my gosh, you're, you do the S gens page. I've seen so many pictures of you or reels or YouTube videos. And so I've become a lot more conscious. So distressed jeans in my thirties is something that I've slowly done away with. Mm-hmm. Also sneakers, because um, I still wear sneakers, but as a black man, we have unfortunately a stereotype where it's very easy for people not to take us seriously. And the sneakers don't, um, sneakers kind of add to that, uh, basically people stereotyping you as someone who's not an entrepreneur or or whatever. So now Mm -hmm. I opt for a cleaner pair of sneakers. If I'm going to wear sneakers, maybe it'll be all white sneakers. Or if it's going to be a Nike sneaker, it's going to be something with a gum bottom, something on the more classic side. Um, I've also gotten to be a lot more fun of dress trousers. There's so many ways you can wear dress trousers, even wearing them with like sandals or or, um, Birkenstocks or sneakers. Like if you take your traditional sneaker and trade in uh, your jeans for a pair of dress trousers and put a polo over it, you'll look so much elevated. So it really depends on what you're trying to do. And then there's place and time too, right? Like I think Mm -hmm. as people 
we really have to pay attention to context. When I'm going to a bar or a night spot with my friends now, okay, I'm not wearing trousers and, you know, I I don't Mm -hmm. want to be too elevated. I want to be a little bit more casual. And so then we'll bring out the fedoras and we'll bring out the print shirts and and jeans and, and different things. There's so many ways to play with your style. It's just very important to contextualize where you're going and what time and place is is this what is the most appropriate attire and uh try not to be so married to your personal taste we it is style is all about others from a weird lens because if when you think about style the number one reason people spend so much on brands is because they want that validation and they want that perception from others of success or wealth right mm-hmm. so if you think about the richest person in the world, it's currently uh, the founder of Louis Vuitton, who owns a conglomerate of brands. And that just goes to show you how many people invest in apparel, in their mm-hmm. personal apparel. So of all the business industries uh, of uh, housing, real estate, uh, technology, it's ironic that the number one industry from a revenue standpoint is apparel. Mm. Yeah. I agree. Love that. And so, Fola, another thing I love that you do is that you talk about the art of mastering the art of dressing with a curated and simple essential wardrobe. So can you explain the concept of a curated and simple essential wardrobe? Yes, I can. Uh, Have you ever tried to get ready for an event and you felt like you had nothing to wear? Uh, At the time. (laughs) Yes. And so I think what happens with style, and this happens to me as well, and this is how I found that these problems exist for majority of people, is that we tend to fill our closets with stuff. And Mm -hmm. we're very uh, bad at cleansing our our closet. We talk about spring, spring cleaning where we're throwing away our old things, but some way spring cleaning doesn't always make its way to our closet. We just talked about being in your 20s and your 30s. And then later on, uh, or we have some listeners who are in their 50s and 60s. -hmm. Your style is going to evolve over time and you want your closet and your wardrobe to reflect that. So the first step to your question is to have less pieces, uh, because when you start to have a plethora of items in your closet, it becomes chaotic. And now there's just too much mess. You can't see through uh, the beautiful pieces that you actually have. Every one of us has amazing pieces. Sometimes I'll work with close friends or celebrities and they have great stuff in their closets. It just gets buried in all the stuff. So the first step is to actually Go through your closet, figure out what you're no longer wearing, what no longer suits your personal style, and just try to condense and consolidate the items in your closet. The second step goes back again to lifestyle. Um, How many pieces do you have that are actually versatile? Um, So as a man, every man should have at least one to three blazers. blazers. Uh, So like a navy blazer is something that you can wear to work. It's something that you could wear to a business meeting or an interview. If you're interviewing someone, meeting with a client, it's also something that you could wear to a wedding. So you have to start thinking about the things that are going on in your life. And if you have the right clothes to to take you there. As a woman, you know, I shouldn't have to tell you, you got to have a solid pair of high heel shoes Mm -hmm. and preferably some that are comfortable a dark pair that you could wear with dresses trousers so starting with those foundational pieces are key the things that you're going to be able to uh what we call get repeat wear out of Mm -hmm. uh there's a context concept called use per wear you want to make sure that majority of your items in your closet are going to have a high use per wear meaning If you pick up an item, you should be able to wear that item at least five to 10 days out of the month. And then you can start once you have these classic uh, timeless pieces that get a lot of use, then you can start building on those pieces, those foundational pieces with accessories, different colors of shirts, things that you can rinse and repeat with your foundational pieces. I I hope I wasn't confusing uh, with that. No. No, perfect explanation, because now it raises another question that I didn't even have down was, uh, so I have, this is from personal experience, 
I have not stopped one year. I didn't do it for a whole year. And then I just took a break and then I didn't do it for another whole year. So I found what I like. But my problem is letting go of things. Like I'll have it in a pile and then I start back trying it on. I'm like, oh, this can go back in the closet. So it's like I found my personal style, but then it's like I still cannot let go of these items. What? Okay, I I have... (laughs) I have a question for you. When you have that feeling of not being able to let go of an mm-hmm. item, what what is the emotion attached to that item? Is it because you feel that it maybe reminded you of a specific time in your life or did you feel mm-hmm. like you paid a lot of money for it? Uh, yeah. Because I think if we can uh, narrow down to what the emotion is behind uh, <laughs> that mindset, I can give you the perfect advice. Well, I think it's one, a lot of stuff. So I stopped shopping because I had a lot of new stuff. So it's like a lot of it is new. And then I just feel like I have good style. So I don't think any of my pieces are bad, but I know like, I don't know. <laughs> you just feel like you're not able to get around to them. Is that? Is yeah. That right? Yes. That's what it is. I, I don't have to wear all the things so I cannot shop. So Okay. So like too I, much. yes. Okay. I, I got you. So I think the, probably the, best suggestion I could give you is to try to wear it. There shouldn't be anything in your closet that you've never worn. And I try to be very intentional about what I wear. So yeah, I know exactly what you mean. You buy something and you just never have a chance to wear it. Force yourself to wear it this week. And once you wear it, you're going to get a feeling of you either love it or it's okay. And once you start wearing something, you either find ways to implement them into your wardrobe more often. Like now I'm wearing this pair of heels more, or I'm wearing this blazer more, or I'm wearing this top more. Or you might wear it and you might learn that you actually hate it, that it's mm-hmm. hot, it's uncomfortable. So you, you know how you go to a dealership and you test drive a car yeah. and you instantly figure out like, ah, it looked good on the eyes outside. The design is beautiful, the color, but I, I don't, I can't do the sound system. You know, I, I need to have my R&B pump in. So, you yeah. know, you got to try stuff out to figure out how you feel about the item. And then you can start to rank those pieces in your closet from the ones that you least like and the ones that you love the most. And if you've worn everything, you should know what you love the most. And then you can kind of just start with the bottom and slowly either donate it to a thrift store. If it's a more Mm -hmm. luxury item, you could put it on resale places like Poshmark, eBay, and get a little bit of money for it that you can invest Mm -hmm. in other things that you like or save, invest. I don't know, whatever you want to do with those funds. Yeah. Okay. So Fola's about to have me dressing up every, for the next couple of months, I'm about to be dressing up. I like that idea. I'm going to wear it. Okay. You should, like, Where you are you should. going? <laughs> and, and you know, the crazy thing about putting yourself together or taking the time to curate your style is mm-hmm. it has this way of making you just a little bit more ambitious. Now yeah. you want to go to this networking event that you weren't really excited about, but you're like, I'm looking great today. I'm going. And then people are complimenting you on your style. And it becomes this addictive way of getting closer to everyone around you, being more active in your community. Style is just a great way, in my opinion, to uh, a better uh, and happiest lifestyle. Mm-hmm. I agree. And when you look good, you feel good. I agree. You feel yeah. good. You play good. Yep. We love that. So let's talk about all of this on brand presence and just for business leaders. So can you talk about how the personal image, I know we touched on a little bit and brand presence can impact, impact a business leader's actual success. Uh, it impacts it in every way because, again, you're seen before you're heard. And so without even attempting to answer your question, I'll just think of some notable celebrities that I know that everybody thinks of and talks about. And then we can kind of think about their personal style and then how they choose to present themselves to their audiences. So Kevin Hart, every time you see Kevin Hart, he's always looking uh, stylish. He has his own personal stylist uh and and you can tell that he invests a lot in the way he looks if he's doing Mm -hmm. a stand-up comedy show if he's doing uh the tonight show or he's on the view anything he's always looking well dressed uh the rock michael b jordan let's talk about steve harvey still steve harvey is now um a style phenom like steve harvey Mm -hmm. goes viral I don't even know what, what's the last thing that Steve Harvey did. <laughs> right. The show. Besides look good. Yes. You know, so it's it's amazing how he's completely 
in his, I don't even know how Steve, how old Steve Harvey is. I would mm-hmm. guess in his sixties, but he's completely reinvented himself and his brand just by also hiring a personal stylist and uplifting his brand image. Uh, even women like, uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of Tabitha Brown. Mm -hmm. She has an amazing stylist, Jay Bolin, and she's always looking dressed to the nine. Style is very important because when people see you, it's like you're painting a picture of who you are. We don't always have the luxury to sit down with everyone for 30 minutes, 49 minutes, or an hour. So sometimes people just see 10 seconds of you on Instagram or TikTok. And that's what they remember. They remember what you look like. And the way you look is a huge insight to how you think your sense of humor, um, how intense your mind works. It's just so many colorful ways to show uh, your personality by, by putting those clothes on. And so style is very important for anyone who's building a brand. I think that everyone who's an entrepreneur should invest in some sort of some styling services just to get someone who can talk to you and help you figure out your personal style, because it could be the reason why uh, everything that you do uh, and touch just becomes amazing just because you took the time to reincarnate yourself and paint a better picture of yourself to the world. Yes, I definitely agree. And that makes me also think about, you know, we talk about personal style and branding and some people are like, okay, but my business is different. Like my image for my company has nothing to do with me. Like, what would you say to an entrepreneur who thinks their personal image and brand doesn't affect their company or how it could affect their company's image? I disagree with that because I think in today's day and age, everything is about transparency. Mm -hmm. So you have a day, you have a, we live in a a generation where everyone, everyone wants to know who the founder of a company is. Everyone wants to know that Elon Musk owns Tesla. They know who he is. Everyone knows who Mark Zuckerberg is. And it's very, very closely aligned. I do think that there are some industries where it doesn't matter as much. So for instance, tech has always been one because the focus has always been on the actual features and the solutions that the product or service provides. Like, we don't care who, what the founder of Uber looks like. We just need to get from point A to point B. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for most of us, through our journey and ascension, um, your personal style can open a lot of doors. It could help you meet the right people. It could get you into places that you may not necessarily deserve to be in yet. So the right fundraising campaigns, um, uh, the right networking events, the right TV shows. Everyone wants to put forth uh, an image that's basically very attractive to audience audiences. Mm-hmm. So I think that it's it's really important for business owners to consider rebranding themselves and taking a little bit more pride in their personal style because. It's not 100% guarantee that it could help, but it will make you feel better and it will change the way that you look at everything that you do. Mm -hmm. Certainly. And now, Fola, one of the things I loved about you sharing your story in the beginning is your experience as a black man, as a professional, as a business leader. And this is launching during our Black Men Who Lead series. So what better time than now to talk about how all of this affects black men in business? So why do you think it's important to discuss this topic when it comes to personal brand, personal style and specifically for black men and black men in business? I think it's important because... To me, being black in business means that you're definitely going to be faced with some sort of prejudice or discrimination along your journey of building and even Mm -hmm. after you're building. And so I think that your personal style is one way to kind of offset the negative stereotypes that others place on us. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it will never... uh, I'm not someone who believes that, oh, if you wear a suit every day, no one will mistreat you. It still happens. I was in the store the other day. I was well-dressed and I still didn't get any uh, service or assistance and the managers were rude to me. So you cannot avoid these uh, misfortunes in in our daily lives. But I do think that 
taking the time to pay attention to your personal appearance, not just your style, your grooming, your hygiene, being, uh, you know, taking care of your beard if you have a beard and making sure it's well manicured. Because people have convinced themselves that we as black men are less than. So why would we want to enable those stereotypes by just showing up? So if you're a chef, have on your apron, but have on a beautiful pair of shoes or a nice hat or, you know, a nice dress shirt underneath. There's so many ways that you can have a nice logo on your apron, right? Mm -hmm. Have a branded apron, make it elevated. Don't just pick up something from Costco. Take the time to create a nice branded apron with an embroidery on it that really showcases your brand. And, And if we pay attention to all the establishments that we aspire to, whether it be restaurants or hotels like the W, you always see that there is a high level of branding. So we want to emulate the the success factors that we're seeing in in other areas of the world and bring it into our industries. And I think I definitely think it will serve us black men well. Mm, Love that. And can you share any advice specifically for black men who are aspiring or new entrepreneurs? Whew, that that's a tough one. Ah oh, man, let me see. What can I give? Um, okay, I have something. Um, so for speaking specifically to to all black businesses or black men specifically? Black men. Black men specifically. Master your audience. Know who your audience is. Uh, business is a selfless act. So have a deep understanding of who it is you're serving, what their needs are. Uh, understand what the pain points are with your business. What are people struggling with? Why would someone not transact with you? I think one of the most common things and frustration in, in businesses, small businesses, all business is, is starting something and feeling like your close friends, people you went to school with, don't transact with you. So maybe you are uh, on a restaurant and people you know aren't coming or you're a real estate agent and no one, (laughs) you see people buying houses left and right and no one's calling Mm -hmm. you. Find out why. Find out why people aren't transacting with you. Strive to be the best version of you that you can be. And then secondly, figure out what your unfair advantage is. And that become that comes in two facets. So you have an unfair advantage for your business, which is what your business does better than most of the businesses, 99% of the businesses around you. Uh, so that could be anything from customer service, the type of product that you uh, offer. So for us at Southern Gents, an example would be um, creating style guides for customers. We, ju- we don't just offer products like every other brand out there, but we're going to curate looks. We're going to curate a wedding look, a business look, a nightlife look, a date night look. Uh, so that's an unfair advantage as a business. So you have to figure out what your unfair advantage as a business could be and double down on that. You also have to figure out what your unfair advantage is as an individual. So what are you really good at? Are you um, a mover and shaker? Do you have the gift of gab? Are you someone who can easily inspire people? And maybe you need to focus on just closing deals and you need to focus on marketing. So my unfair advantage uh, has always been that I have a very creative eye. I can create photography. I can curate outfits. And so I try, I get caught up in these instances where I'm trying to do a little bit of admin work, I'm doing spreadsheets, I'm doing some finance work, but I've learned painfully throughout the years that I need to focus on the things that I have an unfair advantage in, which is creativity and uh, branding and marketing, and really just double down on that. And as, as Black men, we really, really, and women, we really, really need to master the art of delegation. It doesn't mm-hmm. come easy, but If you have an unfair advantage at something, what that exactly means is that no one else can do that one task as well as you can. So why are you spending time doing other things when you have this big void that cannot really and truly be replaced? So double down on your unfair advantage and also master your audience. Mm, Such great advice. I love that. Your unfair advantage. Tip, tip, tip. Okay, now let's talk about some of the work that you are doing and the problems that you are solving. So let's talk about the ways that Southern Gents is helping men with their style needs and motivating them to become the best version of themselves. So your offerings, your process, like how do people work with you? 
So we are a direct-to-consumer brand like a lot of brands today just because the mm-hmm. world has changed so much. People are getting frustrated with going to stores, driving, and uh, it's also run to, tough to run stores. So especially since the pandemic, um, retail has changed, not just in apparel, uh, home goods, all kinds of goods. Things have changed dramatically. People are ordering even things like furniture. We ordered a couch online uh, mm-hmm. two years ago. So the way that we're approaching our business and assisting consumers solve the problem of their personal style is by really thinking about ourselves and our friends, the people closest to us. So I I view Southern Gents as a lifestyle brand. I always Mm -hmm. think about what am I doing? What are my friends doing? I have friends who are executives at you know, Fortune 500 companies. I have friends like myself who own small businesses. I have friends who work for small businesses. And so I always think about what are these people dealing with every day when it comes to uh, their daily lives? So I have friends who do keynote speeches. And I know that And I've seen some videos on Instagram and I'm like, oh, wow, he could have really, really used some help. So we try to create content that is one to one with our audiences and uh, resonates with with a lifestyle. So if it's a guy hopping on the train, uh, we do a lot of like just get ready with me videos, which are really popular on Instagram. We also Mm -hmm. send out newsletters on how to put together a suit, how to dress for a wedding, even for holidays, what to wear on Thanksgiving. These are things that people really, really struggle with. And what we try to do is simplify and basically create a formula of how to consistently put your best foot forward and look your best each and every time. It doesn't have to be complicated. There is some customer education that's involved. So by curating and really living for the customer, I think we're able to give them something that excites them, that inspires them to take their style seriously and live their best lives. Hmm. Love that. So, so amazing. And Fola, you also spoke about the unfair advantage. I want to dive into some of the resources and tools that have really helped you during this entrepreneurial journey. Okay. You are asking some amazing questions. That's a great one. Okay. Let me start (laughs) with, um, so I, I kind of, just to give you a little bit, bit of backstory, um, in my entrepreneurship journey, there were times where I felt like we were doing all the right things and maybe things were not necessarily moving in the right direction or mm-hmm. maybe as fast as I would have liked them to. So I did a lot of research and I uncovered a lot of insightful information. And one of the first authors I ran across was Seth Godin. Mm-hmm. He is an amazing marketer. He has a book called Purple Cow that I think that everyone should read. And Purple Cow is about being remarkable. Uh, and the the underlying concept behind Purple Cow is that no one stops by because they just saw a cow on the street. But if you were driving, you know, across counties and you saw a cow and it was purple, you'd pull over and you try to take a picture. And so the intent behind that is to create a remarkable business, to actually try to be intentional about solving a problem and making someone else's life easier, as opposed to being passionate about an idea that you have that doesn't necessarily serve others. So that's mm-hmm. one. Um, another great business mindset that I've recently ran across is Alex Hormozzi. Alex has a lot of amazing YouTube videos on how to be an entrepreneur, how to um, basically create how to basically create the philosophies within your business that really double down and improve your conversion rates, how to really understand marketing, how to create processes that are fail-proof. And then also, last but not least, there is a a channel called Valuetainment by Patrick Bet David on YouTube. Patrick talks a lot about leadership skills, which is something that we really, really struggle with in the small business and Black community because leadership is important, how to effectively lead, how to create uh, a motivational workforce, best practices for businesses, best practices for entrepreneurs, any one of these gentlemen um, dive into any of their books or videos. And uh, last but not least, I do have one more. Uh, Mm -hmm. There is a book by a black economist, Thomas Sowell. And the book, I believe, is called Black Rednecks, White Liberals. 
That is an amazing, powerful book because it basically breaks down a lot of the uh, stereotypes and myths about discrimination and oppression because Mm -hmm. it's very easy to adopt a woe is me philosophy when it comes to being black in business. It's tough. It's unfair. Uh, Mm -hmm. But Thomas Sowell's argument is that minorities across the world that have been oppressed have found a way to succeed uh, over time. And that the way that they've done that is is by equipping themselves with skills and that skills solve all problems and people are more selfish than they are racist or discriminatory. So if you equip yourself with skills, life will be phenomenal for you. Mm. Interesting perspective. I'm definitely going to check that one out. Uh, that one is, I, sh- I should have put that one at the top. That's a, you got to start with that. <laughs> it's a good that, banker in the banker. That's uh that's uh that one is more about mindset and, uh-huh. and not so much about technical business uh, tips. And mm-hmm. so if you are able to sharpen your mindset and yeah. you change your perspective and view on the marketplace and understand really that there is bar- black privilege, like uh, Charlemagne has so expertly quoted, uh, you start to see things differently and uh, you'll be able to double down on everything else that you read and adopt. Yes, certainly. And we will definitely put that in the show notes. Thank you so much for providing those resources. Fola, what advice would you give to someone in their first year of business? Whoa, man. I love that question. I don't know that I have an answer right now, but wow. First year in business, first year in business is to, I think first year in business comes down to lifestyle because first Mm -hmm. year in business uh, can be discouraging for a lot of people because nine times out of 10, first year in business is not going to go exactly how you think in most case scenarios. You're going to run a lot into a lot of difficulty. Uh, there's going to be a lot of things that go unplanned. Like, so for instance, we've had issues with manufacturing to where we thought we were about to launch a product and then we get the the final batch and we get shipped a hundred pieces of product that I wouldn't give to my next door neighbor. Mm. So where do you go from there? And it, mm-hmm. it, there's just so many challenges that you're going to be going to face. So I don't think first year in business is so much about business. I think first year in business is so much is more about personal lifestyle and mm-hmm. weatherproofing. You know how uh, a storm is coming and they ask us to like, wrap up your pipes and make sure you have the faucet running and make sure you are stocked up on groceries and things like that. It's kind of like that. Embrace mm-hmm. and get ready for the storm. Uh, I think a lot of people uh, don't really understand that and we don't talk about that enough. So if you're going to be, if you're going into business, you want to adopt a lean lifestyle. You want to have very thin overhead. So sometimes you may have to take a flight and maybe live in a different city for a couple of weeks. You want to be very nimble and you want to be almost indestructible. And you're going to have to embrace what's called a season of no. And that means saying no to a lot of things, no to a lot of people, because in your first year of business, you really need to more than ever be selfish because the business is like a brand new baby and it is going to need and require and ask so much of you. And so making sure that folks are cleaning up their personal lives and are ready for the storm or are ready for this new new child that they're bringing into the world, the more you double down and plan it out, you know, try to get on a, on a slimmer budget, figure mm-hmm. out what you subscribe to, um, you know, cancel some stuff. Just just make sure you have some reserves, make sure you have some savings, make sure you're not spending a lot because you're going to have to pour in a lot of your time and your final resources and financial resources into your business. Mm, that was some good advice. All oh, great points. I'm over here like, yep, note it, note it. It's true. Uh-huh. So, yeah, I know that one was <laughs> I know that one was more unorthodox, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, I it's couldn't, real. yeah. And, and I, as being in business, I'm sure you can relate to it. There's mm-hmm. uh, so many things that you probably didn't plan. Maybe you had interviews that didn't come through. Someone said mm-hmm. that they were going to be a guest and they didn't show up and now you're scrambling. And so if you carve out your lifestyle for that level of uncertainty, uh, then you'll be much more likely to actually succeed. Mm-hmm. Yes. And Fola, what for you has been the best risk that you've taken? 
Hmm. Best risk that I've taken. I've taken a lot of risk. Now I gotta, I gotta stack them up and compare. <laughs> um, I remember the biggest risk I've taken business wise was deciding to go full on into apparel instead of just sticking to accessories. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this is where like the people around you really, really matter. You need a strong support circle. So to give you a a really quick story, we were Mm -hmm. doing accessories at the time and I wanted us to manufacture overcoats. We were only carrying bow ties and ties and lapel pins. And I wanted to make this huge leap because I always think about opportunity, right? You have mm-hmm. to find opportunities in the marketplace. So my thought process was an overcoat, just like I told you earlier in the interview, you want to find these pieces that you can have a lot of use per wear and repeat wear items in your closet. So I thought most guys don't own a coat and they probably don't own a coat because the price point usually is really high. They've never had the opportunity to own one. But if you have one coat, you could really wear it from August to March. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I basically found a manufacturer that created these quotes. They provided a invoice. And at the time, remember, we were manufacturing accessories. All the cost to manufacture was really, really small. And so this manufacturer had agreed to to create about 120 pieces and they were going to do it for $7,000. And mm-hmm. I don't think I had $7,000 mm-hmm. at the time. Mm-hmm. This was like eight years ago. And I asked my girlfriend, now wife at the time, I told her the idea and I, I was just so hesitant because I was about to clear my bank account. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I didn't know if this would work. Mm-hmm. And she looked at me and she said, You know, I think it's a great idea. You really want to do it. I know you can do it. And she said, go ahead and do it. And I clicked uh, pay or whatever the digital invoice said. Mm -hmm. And that was our first step into becoming a a menswear brand. And it was a huge risk. It was it felt like uh, it felt like a huge mountain to climb. It felt like I was kind of like just about to. You know, like, I don't know if you've ever gambled, but I gambled Mm -hmm. when I was in high school with $20 and lost it in the mall. So I felt like I was really just throwing my hard earned money that I had saved up away. And Mm -hmm. uh, I was able to move forward. And since then, that's been one of our best selling uh, products Uh, next to our fedoras, our outerwear are something that customers really, really love. And had I never had that um, taken that leap of faith and had the support and encouragement to move forward with that initiative, I don't know that the brand would be here today because men aren't wearing accessories that much anymore, especially since the pandemic. So you got to take this risk. And that what's that's the definition of entrepreneurship. That's the definition of being black in business. Believe in your vision, double down on your vision and go for it. No one sees what you see. So give your gift to the world. I love that. And shout out to the queen for encouraging you and pushing you. That is great. I love that. Yes. You know, we need our black queen. So uh, Mm -hmm. all y'all who out there don't have uh, some kind of queen in your life, please go find you one. (laughs) Right. Well said. And speaking of that, um, how has this, you know, business been for you as a family man and just like what it has it meant for you, for your family and just the support and how do you navigate it's it's tough. It's made me uh, grow up uh, really, really quickly. Not that I wasn't previously grown, but um, mm-hmm. I, I make decisions every day. I make sacrifices every day. Um, but uh, now as a family man, I have the ability to more, more of an extent control my schedule. Um, mm-hmm. So, for example, things like our kid is sick and he has to be picked up from school. Uh, We have the ability to be able to stop what we're doing and and go pick the kids up, spend more time with the kids. Uh, I work a lot. I spend a lot of time on the business. But it's exciting because I know that I'm creating something that my family can be proud of. Now, Mm -hmm. being a father of two boys, I'm really Mm -hmm. excited because 
they are going to get to grow up with the brand and they're going to be part of this journey. Um, I don't know what they're going to want to be when they grow up. They have, I'm not going to force them into <laughs> running the business, but being a family man in business is, is, is really, really tough. Um, it's a never ending cycle of people depending on you. So, uh, I have the family depending on me. We have employees and everyone is looking up to, me uh, for some sort of leadership. And that's mm-hmm. why it's so important to have these resources, these books, these podcasts uh, that you are doing such an amazing job at that can uplift ourselves because it gets really, really lonely. Mm-hmm. And um, this is not something that you can talk to a lot of people about. So a podcast can be something that uh, keeps people a lot of people more than you can possibly imagine going because they may not know anyone in their circle who's starting a business. They may be, they may be the first one in their family to ever have started a business or to even think about the idea of starting a business. Mm -hmm. So having solid resources that people can lean on in times of difficulty, in times of stress or, or hacks. Like I love listening to your podcast, other podcasts to figure out what other entrepreneurs are doing, what other black entrepreneurs are doing, because Mm -hmm. you keep going in these different silos. You go from small business to black business. Mm -hmm. It's different. So you need different, you need different tools to operate with. And, um, I listened to an episode you had with, uh, I don't remember her name, a lady who, uh, is in the PR space and she talks so brilliantly about, why PR is so important for small businesses and black businesses. We need people who understand us to tell our story because Mm -hmm. we're trying to change the world in a very, very unique way. So yeah, it's a, it's an amazing time. And uh, I'm just happy that I uh, have the privilege and opportunity to be able to do this. Yes. Thank you so much. And shout out to Tequila White. That was an amazing episode uh, on PR. Yes. And yeah, Everyone's changing, changing someone's life one way or the other. Mm-hmm. And finally, what does it mean to you to be black in business? Wow. Monique with the questions. <laughs> oh, being black in business is such a privilege. Um, being black in business is a once in a lifetime opportunity to start to defy stereotypes, to start to think, make other people think differently about the way they see us, whether you have a product based business or service based business, basically showing people that we're not three fifths of a human being, that we're intelligent individuals, that we can actually cater to the marketplace, that we have a unique perspective and a lot of value to offer to the world, um, to inspire young black people that Not only is it important to have a seat at the table, but that you can also build tables of your own. Um, I think being an owner is important, a black owner at that, because we have so many untold stories, so many unsolved problems. And if we're not going to do it, who will? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a beautiful time to be in business. I think uh, there's a lot of... There's been massive reductions to the barriers of entry to become in business. So I implore every black individual who has some amazing idea and is dedicated to offering their skill set to the world to just get out there, make something happen and change the world because you really and you truly can. Mm. Love that. So well said. Well, this has been so amazing and insightful. I thank you for pouring into me because I got my consultation. I feel it was like all the notes uh, and also my audience and just the work that you're doing and being intentional with the work that you do. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And don't you worry, there's an invoice coming for all the consultations. Oh, okay. so, uh, charge just, it to the just game. Make sure you, <laughs> charge it to that Amex. So what should we send it? Blacktobusiness.com? <laughs> I got you on the first. I got you on the first. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Thank you so much for having me. This has been amazing. Yeah. It's always a, a therapeutic to be on a podcast and mm-hmm. uh, just excited to that you have this amazing platform. We really, really need it. It's tough to be Black in business, but um, there's never been a better time. Time, and I just can't wait to see what next is coming from your podcast episodes. Thank you. And you are so welcome. Wasn't this episode amazing? Wow. 
Wow, wow. Hey, everybody, this is Jamor, Chief of Growth and Innovation at Black to Business, as well as the founder of Jamor Johnson Consulting. And I will be taking over the recaps for each episode this month as we celebrate Black businessmen. This is what I gathered from today's conversation. The first is to figure out your audience. Clothing can be an armor for so many reasons. So make sure you know what battles you are preparing for. Sometimes the best accessory isn't a loud or colorful garment. It could simply be your knowledge and what you bring to the table. You don't necessarily want to distract people for the wrong reasons. That's why I always ask for the dress code. Of course, I want to stand out, but I don't want to overcompensate on a look just to under deliver on a pitch or a deal. Remember, the most enriching accessory to style is confidence. The second was to find inspiration to help elevate your style. There are ample amounts of publications to assist with your style, like GQ and Esquire magazines. I personally subscribe to GQ. At times, social media platforms like Pinterest and Instagram can also help you express your personal style. It's easy to find style influencers. They're everywhere. Fola also talked about having a curated and simple wardrobe, which really equated to cleaning out your closet and make and getting rid of the clutter so you can see the valuable pieces hiding in your closet. An interesting point that Fola introduced at the conclusion of this conversation was his unfair advantage with creativity. I never really thought of my strengths as unfair advantages, but now I cannot not see them as such. I think we have the tendency to dim our lights to keep others around us from going blind, but maybe it's time to add a precaution. Bring some sunglasses because my future is bright. For more on today's episode, visit www.blacktobusiness.com forward slash 150.